Hi, this is Justin Coletti from Sonic Scoop coming at you from my home studio once again. And we have got a super cool guest for you once again and a super cool topic. We're going to be talking all about mixing drums with a guy who literally wrote the book on drum recording. I believe it's called Recording Drums, The Complete Guide. Or is it Drum Recording, The, uh, the Complete Guide, you said Mr. It Mike right. Major? All right. You said That's it right. Mike Major right there. Mike Major, in addition to having written the book on drum recording, also <laughs> has a fantastic course called Method to the Mix, a series. And the first installment of that series, Mixing Drums on Sonic Scoop, is just a great look at drum mixing. And we're going to go really deep and a little long on some of the principles of mixing drums. So you're going to take a lot out of this for free, even if you never end up buying uh, one of Mike's courses. Just so you know a little bit more about Mike, his credentials. I mean, this guy has worked with some really major artists at the drive-in, Coheed and Cambria, Tall as Lions. He also is a bit of a specialist in acoustic treatment. He actually helped me source all of the panels in this room uh, for GIK Acoustics, where he now helps people kind of build out their rooms. And if anyone here knows my values when it comes to audio, you know that one of the most important things in my book is making sure your room and your monitoring situ uh, situation are together. Probably the most important piece of gear you can have is your room and your monitoring situation, followed by yourself and then followed by all the fun stuff. So I'm really excited. Can't wait to get started with Mike and talk in depth about drum mixing, how to get the most out of your drum mixes, how to get more impact, more power, more size, more clarity, more width, more of whatever you're looking for. Uh, before we dive into it, we do, as always, have to give a shout out to the people without whom this podcast would be impossible. And those people are our sponsors. First one, I'm wearing the t-shirt today, says, my speakers, they're flatter than yours. And why are my speakers flatter than yours? Well, potentially because I'm using Sonarworks. Sonarworks are a sponsor on this podcast this month, and they make really interesting uh, kind of software and combined with hardware solutions where you can play signal into your room, get a sense for uh, where your speakers as well as your room may be lacking, overabundant, underabundant, and help compensate for those. So you can compensate for the idiosyncrasies of not just your speakers, but also your room. I'm a big advocate for room treatment, getting your room to sound as good as possible by treating it. But on top of that, if you use a system like Sonarworks to help EQ your room, you can get even closer. For those of you mixing on headphones, they also have uh, software solutions that are going to help your headphones sound much flatter than they would otherwise. A lot of our reviewers in Sonic Scoop have been uh, big fans of them in the past, so definitely check them out. Also, a big thank you to Sound Toys, making some of my favorite plugins. You can get a free trial of anything Sound Toys makes at soundtoys.com. Some of the most fun and creative plugins uh, on the face of the planet, in my humble opinion. And last but definitely not least, another podcast, Gear Club. If you're not yet listening to Gear Club with John Agnello and Stu Lerman, two fantastic producer engineers, work with people like St. Vincent, Aerosmith, Sharon Van Etten, Sonic Youth, Dinosaur Jr., tons of cool artists. They have a podcast called Gear Club. Check it out, gear-club.net. That's gear-club.net. With the sponsor talk out of the way, I've got on one of my favorite guys writing for Sonic Scoop, Mr. Mike Major, 20 plus year veteran of audio, I think. Mike, how long have you been working in this whole recording mixing field? About 32 years. 1987. Yeah. 87 was my first like paid gig. So wow. yeah. Yeah. I, I took over at a at a studio in El Paso that I ended up running for a long time. And the guy who ran it before I did needed some tape, edited some quarter inch tape. It was like a newscaster had done something. And right. he said, hey, have you ever, you ever edited tape? I said, oh, sure. And I'd never edited tape. And he <laughs> yeah. gave me a script and I called someone who I knew who knew how to edit tape. And he told me what to do. And I sat down and I scrubbed and did all of my cuts and it turned out okay. And, uh, and then eventually I took over and, you know, here I am. So. Nice, nice. And since then, you've worked with a lot of uh, major artists. Uh, you've done a lot of work that uh, I've been really impressed with. And I've got to say, whenever you put out an article on Sonic Scoop that are often among our most popular, because you really do go into a lot of detail and uh, you really don't hold back, A, your opinions, and B, the actual nuts and bolts of how you work and how you're getting great results with a lot of these uh, uh, tracks that you work on. So drum mixing, that's going to be the focus today. I think it's a great one because you've written a book that's really 
detailed about drum recording, but I know that not every set of tracks you get are in great shape. So I know sometimes there's a lot you have to do. Uh, and you've also done this course on mixing drums where people can go with, what is it, like four or five hours long about <laughs> you're yeah, just, mixing just mixing drums right. in real time. So this right. is going to be a very condensed version of that. But we can still, I think, get some of the broad strokes, uh, principles and processes for uh, mixing drums. So uh, like I said, I've been impressed by your sound, especially in uh, the rock domain. Um, but I think the principles we're going to cover can really apply to uh, pretty much any genre. So just big 30,000 foot view of things. When you sit down and you're first starting to work on a track and you're first thinking about how to get the most out of the drums, where do you start? What are you doing? Well, for me, everything starts with a rough mix. Um, you know, I have to you, you got to push the faders up and establish what's there and what works. Um, it, it's, uh, you know, I did a lot of live sound while I was running the studio. I also did live sound for about 20 years. And when you do live sound, you have, you know, half a song to get it together. So I think there's a lot of decisions you make in that first two minutes that are valid. Um, so I probably take that same approach that I hit play and I just start trying to throw a mix up that is balanced and I can hear everything because I just want to know what I've got. Um, so by the time the song is done, I should have it relatively balanced and I can listen and then I'll rewind and listen one more time. And then you start to work on balances and kind of polling what's going on. Like, oh, this is working. That's not working. And you start making your mental notes because it's usually really obvious by the time you've got the first rough done what's wrong and what's going to be the thing you have to work on and when it comes to the drums oftentimes there will be you know parts of the track that are really good and there'll be parts that are not so good and so you start making those mental notes like okay what am i going to be screaming about you know four hours from now and what am i not going to have to worry about too much so you start you know, making all those mental notes. But while I'm doing all that, I'm thinking about, it's like, what do I want this song to sound like? What is this song telling me? Like, is this a big track? Is it a small track? Should it be tight? Should it be dry? Should it be roomy? And I try and make all those decisions before I pull all the faders back down and get started because I want to, I, I try and have some kind of like focus down the, down the, you know, down the road. I almost feel like if, um, if I could mix the way I'm thinking, I could finish the mix by the time I'm done listening the second time because I know what I want it to sound like. I just need to do all the hard work to get it there. Right. So that that's kind of where it is. It's just so to me, it's almost like um, as a corny <laughs> analogy, but it's like chiseling. It's like you're given a block of granite and you just got to take everything away that doesn't look like that thing you're trying to make that's what i'm doing when i'm mixing is like i just got to keep chip like chipping away until that thing that i heard inside of it all comes out at the end right i think the old joke goes how do you make a sculpture of an elephant you uh take a big block of granite you chip away at everything that doesn't look like an elephant there, so, so you're saying that wasn't an original thought on my part? No, Someone I was just, else came up with that. I, I can't believe. I it. was just trying to say for anyone who at home hasn't heard the joke in its full entirety. I mean, come on, you've got to, you've got to get exposed to the full thing. How many of you? You can tell us in the comments below if you heard this joke before. Um, so, I think that you 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 bring up a really good point, which is something that as I've gotten further along, particularly at mastering, I completely agree that the biggest thing is not to go in and start EQing, start moving faders, start trying to um, work with the sound. The first thing is to get an impression and a sense for where are we right now and where do we want to wind up? And I think a lot of new mixers, uh, people who are new in audio, skip that whole part of the process, which is probably the most important important part of the process. You really only have one chance to get a first impression and you only have, or at least at the beginning, you should focus on where are we now? Where do we want to end up? Um, because if you just dive in and start tweaking things, it becomes like an aimless process, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah and you're, you're right about the first impression. That's the thing. You know, you think about the value of your knee jerk reactions to things. You know, it's like when someone sends me a demo you know, my knee jerk reaction has to be like, oh, well, this song, that chorus is great, but you know, the verse is not as good or, you know, all those things are valid, but the longer you listen to something, you start excusing things. It, mm. It's really no different than acoustics that, mm -hmm. you know, when you sit down initially, you're really attuned to what's wrong, but within five or 10 minutes, 
it kind of doesn't matter anymore. Your, your right. ears acclimate. So, you know, you go in your car, you, you listen on earbuds, all those things, you get acclimated to that. But what do you think right now? Like first time you've heard it, what do you think right now? To me, there's a lot of value in that. And that's what I try and use to, to push me down the road there. Right. Great. And I think you're a great guy to talk to with a focus on drums in particular, because from what I remember, your process is you really start with the drums. Once you've done the rough, where I imagine you're just kind of setting balances. Well, I shouldn't just imagine. I should ask, first of all, when you talk about a rough, are you talking about I'm starting with faders at zero and then bringing things up and setting balances and making a rough mix? Or are you talking about listening through a rough mix that was provided to you by the client? No, I, I, I always do it. I always do my own rough. Like if somebody sends me a rough, I, I, I kind of have strong opinions. Maybe I'm just an egomaniac, but <laughs> I always want to get my own take on it. Yeah. Most of the time, that's okay. Every now and then you'll get those times where someone has a rough and really the, what they want is their rough refined. But mm -hmm. I prefer to go in and make my own judgment on what's there because I don't know how they arrived at that rough. I don't know, do those guitars fit together? You know, are this, why are the symbols, the overheads reversed of the toms? Was that on purpose? You know, it's like those kinds of things that I want to know. And I can only figure that out if I start with everything down and throw the faders up and, and, and put a mix together. I can tell that you're super old school for a couple of reasons. And one of those reasons is that you hair. tear it's down faders hair. and yep. bring them up. That was going to be the third reason. I think I have almost as much gray hair as you, Mike, and I haven't been in this business oh, yeah. as long. I mean, look at the beard. Come on. There's more gray hair in my beard than on your entire head. It, well, yeah, I, I, I need to, if I had a beard, it would probably be quite <laughs> right. gray. We'll but, have to compete you know. one of these days. But so that's one of the things that makes me know that you're old school is that you like to tear down faders and then bring them up. I think that's a great exercise uh, because you could always go back and refine some someone else's rough later if you're not getting to the place they are married to, to the mix going. The other reason I know you're old school is because you said after you listen to the rough, you rewind. And I don't think the young people know what rewind oh. is anymore. I don't think <laughs> yeah. that's a thing. Yeah. Sorry. I, 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 still, uh, there's I a, there's, say, yeah, is that the skip tape. back it's 30 seconds tape. button on iTunes where you can skip back 30 seconds for a podcast? That's the rewind button, right? There, okay. Yeah. Uh, so, but once you've done that, once you've listened through the rough mix that you're creating for yourself... The first thing that you do, if, if I understand correctly, is you approach the drums, right? Can you tell us about that process when you're going to the drums? Well, first of all, why do you start with the drums? And second of all, what are the first things that you do? Well, yeah, I, I do start with the drums. You know, like I said, I, I try and make my mind up early on. And uh, I generally trust myself, you know, so... I've got my picture in my mind. I know what all the other, other instruments are supposed to do. And I know how the drums are supposed to support, support that. So that's where I'm going to start. I'm going to build that big supporting structure that the drums will provide. Um, so, you know, I mean, I know a lot of mixers and a lot of mixers I respect who I think are great that say they always keep the vocal and they're always working on things in balance. And I personally see too much value in being able to understand exactly what's going on between each mic and, you know, I've, I've, I've found that I can make something better if I get down to that level of detail and, um, you know, time relationship, phase relationship, all those things. You can't hear that when you have everything else up. You really do have to do that all at once. Um, you know, there's a time to think of it in context, but that's going to it's only going to have context when I have the whole mix together. Mm -hmm. So instead, I'm going to say, OK, I know what I want my drum sound to be. It's going to be whatever. Let's say it's going to be a roomy drum sound. Then I'm going to build a roomy drum sound and I got to start from the beginning. So, um, you know, yeah. So then I just pull everything down and start building. You know, that's that's just and I don't. And sometimes the drums will take 45 minutes. Sometimes it'll take a couple of hours. It's just mm. until I'm like, OK, I feel like I can throw the bass on top of this now and it's going to hold its own. You know, that's kind of. I'm not done until I get to that point that I feel like I've really, and, and I still continue to refine, you mm -hmm. know, snare drums in particular, even when I'm tracking, that's the thing that will drive me more crazy than anything. I think the snare drum is so central to the sound of a track that if I don't get that right, I'm never happy. I'm yeah. never happy until I get the snare to sit right. And I've had times where bands are like, can we just start tracking? I'm like, yeah, but you know, the snare is not quite there. It sounds fine. It's like, no, it really doesn't. It really doesn't. And you'll see what I'm talking about when I get it. And then you get it and everyone's like, oh yeah, well that is better. You know, so, uh, you know, it, it's a bit obsessive and maybe 
I mean, I would never hold someone back who's in a creative mood to like, oh, we're not going to track because Mike's obsessed about the snare drum. It's, it's nothing like that. But I just know that there's one chance to get it right. So, right. You know. And I do think that uh, I'm almost of two minds about, I mean, there is that, uh, that very wise saying that, uh, you know, no one goes home, you know, after hearing a great new song, uh, whistling the kick drum sound. But with that Agreed. said- there are a lot of productions when people are thinking about the impact that a production has on them and the feeling that a production leaves with them. Two of the most central things really do end up being the snare and the vocals. And I know from doing a lot of attended sessions with uh, mastering clients, when they really hear their records next to some of their favorite records, those are the two things that they often notice. If it's like their first record. In hindsight, they say, wow, we could have pushed that snare and that vocal even more. Like listening yeah. to some of our favorite records, how big they are and how much they command uh, the the listener's attention and how central they're allowed to be. And if they're going to be as central as they are in some major productions, you really got to make sure that that vocal sound and that snare sound are, are, are somewhat captivating because they're the, the two first things uh, to grab people. Of course, there are exceptions to that. If you're listening to some shoe, some shoegaze records where maybe there's the snare is a little buried and the voice is a little buried, like that can happen. But I would say in the majority of productions where people walk away remembering the production, I mean, that snare is captivating and interesting in its own right, usually. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I think it it's a little bit of an oversimplification when people say, oh, you know, the vocal, it's all about the vocal. Yeah, that's true. That is true. But why do we record a hundred tracks and stuff? <laughs> right. You know, why doesn't everyone just release a record with just a vocal and a keyboard or a vocal and a guitar? Because mm -hmm. the rest of it really matters. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people, I got to hear the vocal, got to hear. It's like, well, yeah, that's true. But do you really think the first time everyone heard Smells Like Teen Spirit, that anybody had any idea what he was saying? <laughs> right. The first 10 yeah. times, maybe. Mm -hmm. But you heard the track, you heard the drums, the big drum intro and the guitars. And that's what you remember. That's all the production. And that is equally important. You take all that away and it's not the same song. Now, when you have the benefit of that in hindsight, then you can go back and do your unplugged version. Everyone goes, God, I love this song. It's like you wouldn't have felt the same way about it had you not heard it the way it really ended up first. Mm, you know, so interesting. I tend to think there's a reason we got all this stuff around there. And if the vocal was the only thing, then why are we recording all this other stuff? You know, I, uh, so I think it's all important. Well, that's a great point. Uh, I, for me, I'm going to play devil's advocate just a little bit and say I think it works in both directions that ideally the best productions are probably going to come out of those tracks where if you start with a track where or a song where it really stands on its own. If you're just hearing it on acoustic guitar and vocal or piano and vocal, and you can make a song that's compelling only already in that format before adding stuff on, that those are going to lend themselves to making the best big productions. Um, right. You know, so it, it works a little bit both ways, but I totally hear what you mean. If, if it that, wasn't beneficial to do all this, why would people <laughs> be right. doing it well, all And, the and time? even that, like when you get a song like that, that's so good like that, you know, the mature mind says, why are we, why are we overdubbing on that? Mm -hmm. It's like, this is, this is amazing. Why would we do anything? So then it becomes even more delicate. Like, well, it was great when you were just sitting here next to me singing with an acoustic guitar, you know, well, I'd really like some bass. Well, you know, some shakers would be good here too. You know, I know these singers that are, they'd be great. It's like, well, we're getting away from what was so compelling about it. But again, that kind of comes down to production decisions and all that. And, and genre for that matter, yeah, because, absolutely. you know, if it's a rock band, there's a reason there's four guys on stage or five guys on stage. It's like, that's who everybody wants to hear. Yeah. You take any one of those elements away and it's not the same anymore. No, I totally hear you. So, uh, we, so we don't go off on too much of a tangent here. Right. Yeah. You, when you're sitting down, you're focusing on the drums and it could be, you said for 45 minutes or an hour, just on drums. Now out of curiosity, how long might you spend on an entire mix? Are you one of the kinds of guys who's finishing a song in four hours and eight hours and 16 hours? What are your norms? You, you know, the, I mean, the drums, the drums tend to set the pace, you mm -hmm. know, like, uh, be, because again, I am somewhat obsessive about it, but it can be, it can be the 45 minutes. It could be two hours. It could be more if it's really fight. Like if, if it was just a horrible recording <laughs> and I'm trying to find some way to make it music, like I want it to jump out of the speakers somehow. Mm -hmm. Um, I, sp I definitely spend more time on that stuff. I think the mixing part 
is pretty easy. You know, like once I get the drums done, I usually have the band done within a half an hour, 45 minutes after that. And mm. then I drop the vocals in and start working on overall kind of gain structure issues and how, how hard am I going to hit the, the stereo bus and all that stuff. But once, you know, I guess to an untrained ear, after about three hours, it should sound pretty much like it's going to sound. But then I'll spend another whatever. It could be 10 hours after that working on automation and making things interesting and trying to, right. you know, I mean, I, I mean, I just finished a mix for a guy that after we've done revisions, it's probably 20 hours. You right. know? And, Isn't it funny how we, we can end up spending 90% of our time fixing the last 10%? Yeah, uh, so that's exactly time. right. And we've and gotten just, so much of the low hanging fruit out of the way early and we could almost at any point be like, oh, we're done and that's good enough. But it's, it's hard to walk away when there's always something that could be tweaked. And, 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 and I think, you know, the maturity level comes in if you know when to stop, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I've found the greatest, the only way I can tell I'm done is if I can push myself away from the console and I don't feel the need to go back up right. because when you're sitting here, you're constantly touching, tweaking, just little, little adjustments and, and you won't think anything of it. But once you go to the back of the room where you can't touch anything, if you can stay back there for the whole song, you're like, you know, it's pretty yeah. good. Then it must be done. You know, that, then I, I don't feel the need. Man, when it came to mixing, that was always where I did my best listening is at the back of the room without my right. hands on the faders. Because at that point, like you said, you're not tweaking. You're just listening and you're really figuring out, well, what really needs to be tweaked? And near the end of a mix, I do love to do that. I sit down on the couch with a pen and paper and I just write down the things I need to change. And then hopefully, you know, there's six things at one point and then you go back and there's four things and you go back and there's three things. And then it's like, yeah, there's, there's nothing else that obviously needs to be done. Uh, another thing that's helped me, I know that I'm done when I'm putting in automation changes of like a 10th of a DB and I'm like, Ooh, <laughs> right, is it better right. up to D uh, up point right. two DB or just point one DB? And it's like, yeah, if you're splitting I, those I know, hairs, man. you're done. Yeah. I'm really feeling that 10th of a DB, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah. Two tens would have just been wrong. Yeah. If you're making those kinds of decisions, you're done. So we could, oh my goodness. It's so great to talk to you, Mike. I know we could jump all over the place, but I want to keep this yeah. focused. We're going to be like a right, train sorry, talking about drums. So they're the round ones. One of the interesting things, all, all, only the good ones. Are, yeah. um, I wonder, I now I'm wondering if square drums have ever been invented and how they sound, but that's for another podcast. Okay. Before we go down that rabbit hole, one of the interesting things about your process um, is that it almost seems to me like when you're starting your drum mix, you are kind of doing the recording engineer's job again. Like I almost feel like you're a second recording engineer the way that you sit down and first approach drums. So can you, can you tell us about those first few things that you're actually doing when you're manipulating those drums? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I'm trying to get the drums without anything, you know, any real processing them on to feel like they were recorded the right way, you know, and I, I guess the right way is a very subjective thing, but maybe what I think is the right way, you know? So, I mean, I, I, I took a lot of pride in the way I tracked drums. I never get to track drums anymore because, you know, I'm here, I work at home, people send me stuff to mix. It's just pretty rare, but it was one of those things that I know there were a lot of things that you could fix on the floor with the mics and the drummer and you can retune things. You can make sure he's hitting it right, all that stuff. Well, by the time it gets to me to mix, I can't do that anymore. So I kind of, see what I can do to get the tracks closer to what I think they should have been when they left the studio. So yeah, you're right. I, I, I look very closely at all the time and phase relationships of every drum to every other drum, you know, every mic to every other mic. And, um, over, you know, over time it, it, it's been refined, you know, where, I mean, it used to just be, it was a matter of just reversing polarity or not, you mm -hmm. know, but, the more I worked, you know, in your typical, I mean, I'm in Nuendo, but like working in Pro Tools or whatever, it was, it was obvious what a big change you can make just by nudging things, five, 10, 15, 20 samples. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've had people, well, who would care? It's like, it, it's not like it's magic. It's just when you hear it, you're like, it's so obviously better. It is so obviously better because, you know, getting the kick and the snare to work together first and you can sh slide one or slide the other. And you just, I, that's what I do. I slide one. And if I, I go too far and it's like, well, that sucks. And I keep coming back. Well, that's better, better. Let me try the other one. And, and one of them will, will rear its head as being the one. So then you start there. You get the kick and the snare, work together. Time-wise, mess with polarity if you need to. 
and then you keep going on. So I get that up and then I go with the overheads and same thing. Overheads, slide them, don't slide them. Make sure that they're working together left to right before you get to, you know, with the kick and snare and then make them work with the kick and snare. And then I throw in the room mics, the same thing. And I do that same thing with the toms, with the hi-hat, everything, unless it was really well tracked. And it does happen that sometimes people send me tracks that I, I really can't really improve much. And I'm thrilled because it's like, well, this is great. You know, it's just that much, but I still force myself to go through the process because I, right. I find things, you know, you find things by mistake. Sometimes you'll just like, oh, wow. Like normally I would nudge a snare, you know, for example, maybe I nudge it 50 samples and then all of a sudden you get one mix where you do it like 140 samples. And I'm like, man, that seems like a lot, but holy crap, it sounds good. You know, mm. it sounds really fat right now. So whatever. As a matter of fact, right. I don't even look at the thing. I just, I just tap nudge, nudge, nudge until I hear it and go, oh, that's it. And then I'll look back to see what I did because it may give me cues about what I got to do on the other drum mics, you know? Right. This is really interesting. So um, I just want to back up a hair for those who may not understand what we're talking about. First of all, Mike has a really detailed article about this concept, about uh, phase aligning and time aligning your drums. And it's not something that everybody does. Um, you know, there are some recordists and mixers who go for a very minimal approach. Um, some One of my favorite recordists and mixers on the opposite end, end of the spectrum is Gabe Roth of Daptone Records. And I've had the, the privilege of interviewing him a couple times. And he likes to use one mic whenever possible on the drums, right? So he's taking literally one microphone, trying to find the best balance he can get out of that one mic. And it's like done. And obviously there's no phase alignment there to do. Some people like to do a very minimal approach. They've got a couple of overheads, a snare mic and a kick mic. And they're spending a lot of time just, you know, massaging those until they're phase coherent on the way in. And, but once you get up to, you know, eight mics on drums, 12 mics on drums, 16 mics on drums, there's almost always going to be a situation in which the phase relationship between any two mics could be better. And what you're trying to address, it sounds like when you're first going in is double checking each channel against every other channel to say, right. are these phase relationships the best they could be? Because if they're not, um, we are going to be kind of losing power. And just so that we're not going over the head of anyone who happens to be listening, I feel like I have to say what phase and polarity is just for anyone who's a little bit newer to this. Um, when you have an audio waveform, you know, there's a peak and a trough. So if you have, let's say the classic example is two mics on a snare drum, one pointing down, one pointing up. Well, while one waveform is peaking, the other waveform might be troughing and that can end up sucking power. You can get a lot of thinness, you usually lose low end first. And when you have 16 different mics, there's these <laughs> all these combinations where the phase between one element and another can be lousy. So ideally, you would spend all day moving mics until all the relationships were perfect. But that's probably, in many cases, less feasible than doing what you're doing, which is get as good as you can in the session, and then afterwards double check and say, would any of these sources be improved if we were to just nudge the mic basically virtually forward or back from the instrument, which is what you're doing by right. sliding samples, right. or by reversing the polarity on these things. You know, In those cases where the peak and the trough are happening at the same time, reversing the polarity can kind of make them both better. And I guess, are you first doing your polarity, getting it the best you can that way, and then tweaking the time from there? Or is there a particular order that's done? In? Um, I, I probably, you know, it would be, you know, the kick, I just start like, for example, with the kick, I'll get that kind of sounding. I mean, I might do a little bit of EQ on it just mm -hmm. so it's more like, cause there's going to be some kind of bump in it that I want to get rid of. So maybe I'll do that and then I'll put the snare up and I leave the polarity as it is. And then when I nudge, I will go until I hear it hit a null where it's like, okay, it's clearly thin right now. Mm -hmm. And when it hits that lowest null, then I'll reverse the polarity and see, is that better? Oh, and then, interesting. and then go, okay. And then I'll shift back 40, 50 shift forward. And so you kind of go up and back and up and back. And then you find like, okay, this is the worst it could be. Now I flip, I flip the polarity. Get it. Did it get much better or did it get a little better? Was it better when I was normal polarity and 60 samples earlier? And I mean, it, it sounds like this really deep, it's, it's not, it's just, you listen and you go tap, tap, tap. Oh, that's good. Tap. Oh, that sucks. Polarity. Oh, that's better. But tap, tap, tap. That was better. Okay. Done. Yeah. It really is literally, it takes a minute, you know, you just have to pay close attention to what's happening 
you, you know, because maybe some things will get better and other things will get worse. And that, that just has to do with not only the phase relationship, but the time relationship relative to the phase relationship, because certain frequencies right. will just jump up and jump up and others will jump up and, and fall down and so on. So you, you're kind of just making a, an overall judgment as you tap through and go, Oh, there it is. That's the spot. Right. And for anyone who wants to go into more detail on this uh, process and exactly how Mike breaks it down, he has got a great article up on Sonic Scoop. It is called Advanced Drum Mixing, Time Aligning Your Drum Tracks for Better Phase Coherence. Really popular article up on Sonic Scoop. We've got a lot of great feedback on it. Details this process in a really kind of clear, you know, step one, step two, repeatable way that it really simplifies this process and makes it seem much less daunting than maybe we're making it sound right now. Uh, I'll put the link to that in the show notes so anyone can check that out. And I imagine you could also show people you doing this re in real time in the mixing drums course for anyone That's who correct. wants to kind of yeah. see you do it and actually hear these changes as they happen. But for the, uh, the quick, you know, Hey, here's the uh, the process, and here's how it sounds before and after. Check out that article. Be in the show notes. Advanced drum mixing, time aligning your drum tracks for better phase coherence. Okay, so assuming that we've spent that time, we've made the drum sound as good as we can without doing much of the way of EQ. Really, by just double checking the engineer's work and making sure uh, he or she got the time and phase alignment as good as possible. What's the next step? Where are we going from here? So yeah, so I do kick, I do snare, I get those right. Um, and oftentimes before I actually throw the overheads in, I have kind of a, a, I, I use a few different methods of parallel compression through my mix, but with the drums, I like to do parallel compression on the kick, the snare and the toms only. I don't ever put the cymbals in there because it just gets to be a mess. And I think when you compress, even when you hard, you know, do hard compression on a drum, it's always something additive and cool. But when you do it on a cymbal, all you do is reveal how much you're messing with it. That's, <laughs> that's how I feel about it. Because yeah. a cymbal has such a linear decay um, that it, it's, it's so obvious when you mess with the time response of it. Right. You really bring up the, the trash and the like that sustain. You know it should be decaying in this way, but it's coming back up and you really hear the release time. And, exactly. Yeah, and yeah. it's like, instead of it going like, bang and then like this it goes like bang and it just kind of you know mm -hmm. does this weird it's like well that's not what a cymbal sounds like so i tr i mean there's always going to be some compression on the cymbals it's just going to happen but oh, i yeah. want the meat and potatoes to be on the kick the snare and the toms mm -hmm. so as i get my kick and snare basically like i want them then i dump them in my into a really aggressive parallel bus and then i bring that in and i want to get my kick and snare with parallel compression driving the bus a certain way. Like I, I have some mm. VU meters that I, that I use. I, 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 when I went into the digital world, I was lost because I didn't have VU meters. And so I had a buddy design a circuit and I built this handmade little VU meter box. And that's how I start my mix. I realized how tied I was to that from my years of live sound and working on consoles that had VU meters. Um, mm -hmm. So I kind of get it to where I'm driving my kick and snare are in this minus seven to minus five range on my VU meters. And then I don't have to look at the meters again until I'm almost done. Because once I've got that set, that's my, I know I've got headroom left. I know everything above that is gonna fit because I've left room for it. Um, so then I start with my overheads and I turn off kick and snare, listen to the overheads and I make sure they're balanced left to right and that the snare is in the center. Cause that, that, that that's a big problem. You know, I'm, I have very strong opinions about the way overheads should be placed and it's not necessarily the way most people do it. And it doesn't mean that they're wrong. It's just, it's something that I, you know, I'm looking for a good, strong center snare because the snare is pretty much always in the center. And we're talking specifically about the rock pop idiom here. I imagine if you're Correct. doing like a jazz recording and the snare is a little more off center and, you know, it could be appropriate for that uh, idiom. But when we're talking about people who are interested in mixing drums, we're generally talking about the uh, a produced sounding drum right. feel. And in good that point. context, yeah, I absolutely agree that getting things centered kick and snare is a big deal. Now, every once in a while, depending on how the overheads uh, were mic'd, there can be a compromise between how centered the kick is compared to how centered the snare is. Are you making trade-offs there or are you just kind of eliminating the kick a little bit from the overheads or do you have other ways of making them both mono? What's your approach between the centering the kick versus centering the snare? Well, 
I've found that the kick tends to pull our ear less than the snare does when it's mm -hmm. off center, you know, because of just the frequency response where the majority of the energy is from the kick is going to be, you know, 200 down, 300 down. And that, I mean, I like to leave my overheads full bandwidth. I don't, I don't like mm -hmm. filtering. The only time I filter them is if I'm going for a really dry, tight sound and maybe it was recorded in a booth and I keep hearing the booth and the only way I can get rid of that is to filter some of that crap out. But mm -hmm. um, I've found that for the most part, I will, I will go for a snare center and a kick slightly one way or the other. When I place the mics, I draw like a, a line through the kick and snare, like since the kick is always off to the right, snares like this. So I draw a line this way, so that's my center, and then I place the overheads with respect to that different center. You know? Right, you're talking about for recording. Tracking. If you're, yeah. yeah, if you're tracking, and I know that was feedback I got quite a bit when I looked, when I showed uh, I have a drum miking uh, series that's pretty popular on the YouTubes. Uh, and when I showed Space Pair, I showed the I was showing like the most classic approaches to uh, miking, and I showed overhead Space Pair with kind of the kick drum centered and the snare off a little bit to the side as kind of like a classic position. But yes, if you take you have these two uh, overheads over the kit, and say you have this the kick drum centered, if you just turn them. Not quite forty-five degrees. Right, you right. are Just able to the center whole thing, the right? But yeah, the one thing that does change there is that the spread of the symbols changes, and right. it, again depends on what you're going for. If you're going for a much more produced down the center uh, drum feel, what you're talking about is probably the best approach. If you're going a little bit more retro, open, natural, organic kit feel, then I think that old school centering the kick and letting the snare be off to the side can work. But it really it depends on the needs of the production yeah. at hand. And what I, you're talking about, so much of your, I think, biggest work has been kind of heavy rock work. And yeah. I think in that world, getting the kick and snare straight down the center is huge. There's no right. reason for them right. to be off it's, to the It's sides. like kick, kick, snare, bass, vocal. That, yeah. That's what goes in the center. And everything else just goes way out there, you know? So yeah. I want, and also I want to mix the guitars loud mm -hmm. and I want to mix the drums loud. And the only way I can do that is if everybody's, kind of got their space, you know, and that's, yeah. that's, that, that, that helps re like solidify that, you know? Right. Wonderful. Cool. So we've done the, uh, all the phase and time alignment. You've worked on getting the kick and snare to pretty much sound right in and of themselves. And then you're literally just bussing off your kick and snare to a shared parallel bus. And Correct. you're generally not putting overheads or room mics through those because you think the unless you want a special effect the symbols right. just get too gnarly so you right. can just compress the the kick and snare um and then are we done what what happens uh, from here or are you now so bringing the, in room mics what's so, going on so then yeah room mics would be next and you know i always compress the room mics some mm -hmm. depends on the style if it's aggressive i'll compress them a ton Mm -hmm. But there's almost always too much symbols in there. So oftentimes I'll roll off mm -hmm. all that upper high frequency hashy kind of stuff. So I don't hear so much of that symbol swell and everything. I'm really just looking for it to fill in that low mid, low end right. woof kind of stuff. Um, and, and it's kind of, I wish more people would pay close attention to that, to the high frequency content in the room mics, because yeah. if you make sure it's nice and smooth and maybe even rolled off. It, it fits together in the image, you know, because what happens is I'll compress these room mics and when I get them to where I really love it, there's way too much just right. from the hi-hat and the cymbals. And it's like, so now I'm going to have to use reverb to get the ambience the way I want. Even though the room would have been fantastic, mm -hmm. it just makes the whole image just collapse, you know? Because right. there really is no strong image from a mic, a pair of mics that are 10 or 12 feet away. That's It's mm -hmm. just drums over there you know yeah so yeah. so i like to treat it like drums over there i just want that ambient so i'd rather have i always use you know ribbon mics low to the ground maybe mm -hmm. facing away from the kit whatever oh. so it's anything to cut down on the amount of high frequency content so when yeah. i compress that thing the kick and snare go blah yes nothing else does you know right and uh, another of the classic techniques that some people will employ will be the the drum tunnel kind of thing, or if you can yep. do some packing blankets, you know, held up with mic stands, and then you kind of have the one of the far out mics down there. But yeah, often I've had good luck just with if a drummer knows how to hit appropriately, and you can coach them so they're not hitting the cymbals louder than they're hitting the drums, which is often right. a problem in the studio with new drummers. Um, if they're not doing that, then a, a good mic 
fairly low to the ground, pointed more at the uh, the kick, can give you a lot of kick and snare and not as much of the uh, trash from the uh, the cymbals. Uh, one other thing, I, I heard you say that sometimes you like to turn the mics around when you're recording yep. so they're facing the other way. I like that too. However, there's two issues there. One, it's a great way to get ambience, but there can be a little bit of natural delay where it's almost like a slapback out of those mics. And two, so, although you do mute the cymbals, sometimes you miss that crack and impact off of the kick and snare that you can get with a mic that's actually facing the kit. So although I like that technique, it, it does feel a lot more ambient and roomy than distant drum kit power, you know? At least that's right. my take on it. But fantastic. So on the... Mixing in. So now we've folded in our room mics to taste. Once you've gotten your close sound and your overhead sounds right, now we're bringing in the room mics. Uh, what's left to do? So then um, I'll usually see if I need reverb at that point. I mean, I I probably use reverb on every mix, but I try and hide it to where you don't know I'm using reverb. Like I want it to sound like the room, only cleaner. I'm, mm. I'm trying to mimic the general sound. Maybe... The room was good, but it wasn't a long enough decay. So I want it to just, for those two things to kind of feather into each other. So it's one sound. Like, I mean, honestly, if people notice reverb on my drum sound, I'm kind of bummed. You know, right. I don't want them. I want it to sound more like I got to record this in this fantastic room. And that's that's the illusion I'm going for. That is, but, unless you're mixing a Tears for Fears record. And then if people don't notice the reverb on your drums, then, then you're going to exactly right. Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> um, There's always a but, caveat somewhere, Mike. Always. So always. what are yeah, some I, of those principles when you're going for the more natural power uh, sound out of a reverb? What are some of the principles um, in setting reverbs that help you hide them and make them blend into know, the, the natural ambience of the kit? I've really come to love the convolution reverbs for that because there's some you can start with a room and then it's just a matter of maybe tweaking the way the e like the snare and the kick drive it with EQ or changing some of the higher high high mid high frequency decay characteristics in the shaping of it or you can change like the diffusion of it you know I've found when it's really dense that that sounds more like reverb to me but if you lower the density so it's a little more like hundreds of discrete echoes to me that sounds more like real life and it tends to it sends t tends to sit in the track a little more transparently as even though it seems counterintuitive you'd think the denser reverb would be more transparent but to me every time that, that was a mm. problem i had like the lexicon 480ls they're fantastic reverbs but i could never get a drum sound that i liked a drum reverb i could get out of them because they seemed too lush and too dense and I would always go to something cheaper and older and I'd be happier with it, you know? So um, Interesting. the convolutions to me are nice because they're always samples of real spaces. And so they have all that kind of quirkiness. And and oddly, uh, you know, it goes back to like room mics, you know, even crappy recorded room mics, somehow they always work. Even if you got to EQ the living hell out of them and compress the, the you know, the life out of them, it's still a believable ambience and it always seems to add something that you cannot do with reverb. I don't care what I do with a reverb. I've never found one that will get close to even a bad room when it comes to realism, you know? Right, so right. I, even when people are in a tiny little box of room, I'm like, well, just put some mics on the floor. Just give me <laughs> something. Just so yeah, there's something yeah. that I can maybe extract the slightest bit of reality out of, you know? And, and now generally, what are you feeding into your reverbs? Is it just your close mics or your room mics or yeah. your overheads going in there? Usually kick snare toms. Mm -hmm. um, if it's a if if I didn't get room mics, which does happen, not often, but if it does happen, then I'll, I'll dump some of the reverbs in there, and I might run two reverbs. Um, like uh, I've I've done that where I'll do a kind of realistic roomy thing, and then I'll have one that's just a really bright like a plate, mm -hmm. but it's short. It's like you know 0 0.6, 0 0.8, and it's really mm -hmm. just there for high frequency enhancement. Right. And so I'll dump the snare into it. I probably won't put the kick in there because you'll hear it going, psh, psh. I don't want that. Mm -hmm. I want it to be where it just sounds like the snare was brighter in a room, you know, mm -hmm. and it's something that kind of gives you almost like an EQ, like an EQ control on a fader. You right. Know? So you're looking more for sizzle and air and excitement and less for reverb be sustain out of that. Right. Yeah. Right. And again, I've done it with delays before even where you can take right. a, like just short delays and you, 
run the feedback up enough. Like maybe if you got a six tap delay and you can do a bunch of short delays and then it's kind of like that, <clears throat> almost like the early, you know, the early Mutt Lang snare sound, mm -hmm. like, you know, what he was doing before they had the kind of reverbs that he ended up using where they were doing these kind of modulated short delays. Mm -hmm. It's just like a, it's just this big kind of rough sound around the snare sound, you know? Right. Interesting. Uh, real quick, you mentioned toms. We, we didn't talk about them much before. Do those go through your parallel bus at all? Uh, at they being do. a close they mic, do. they do. Gotcha. All right. Yeah, and and you know toms. I try and EQ so each one sounds right. Mm -hmm. I find that when I EQ the close mics, I always do more EQ than I end up actually using because by the time I put them in with everything else, I usually sneak some of that mid range back in because then they start sounding too high fi and too. I, I, it's like, I used to be really into wo like these hi-fi, big low end, clear top end toms. Mm -hmm. And now I'm finding that I think I want more mid range in my toms. Cause I hear more of the kind of the character, the head and the resonance and all that stuff. And uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm swinging back that way. Right. Now. More of um, having them blend in as a part of the yeah. kit rather than here's the rototom fill, but it's actually right, just right. toms. Just a, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like. I don't want that. There are know? a couple ways to go and that really, man, the song has to drive that so much because I have uh, sometimes heard people EQ these beautiful, brilliant, like big on bottom resonant toms with a lot of clarity and they come in. It's like, whoa, did you hear those toms? But it's like distracting me from the song. And I think right. there's that thing of not losing the forest for the trees of um, there can be that impulse to make every element sound really high, fine, exciting. But sometimes you do that and it's like, oh, I just got distracted from the vocal sound. And now the vocal sound by comparison feels smaller because of how big those toms were. So contrast, you know, and mixing yeah. is absolutely huge. Uh, another quick question around this stuff with reverb, just staying on it for a tick longer. Do you have any principles for setting the decay length or the, uh, a pre-delay? Are you timing those to the track at all? Or are you not um, that specific about it? I'm not that, I, you know, I, I always add, I don't know, 18 to 20 milliseconds of pre-delay just to where it, I can feel a little bit of space between the two. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't like to hear that discreet, like, you know, it was very 80s thing to have that, type of mm -hmm. thing. I don't ever want to do that. You know, mm -hmm. that, that, that's just like, Hey, look at me. I know how to set a reverb type of thing. So you're um, missing out on all these classic eighties retro uh, records. You can mixing Mike. I mean, e even in the eighties, I had trouble doing that. You know, I can remember <laughs> trying to use a lot of reverb and just never feeling clean about it. You know, it's so funny, you know, early on in my career, uh, more like early two thousands, a lot of the artists I worked with initially, I mean, I work with a lot of hip hop artists, but then in the rock world, I was working with a lot of like, there's kind of like a neo shoegaze thing going around. And it really was, you know, it had been so unfashionable for so long to have big reverbs on snares that people were like, let's do some 80s reverb on this snare. Yeah. And it was like a thing for a few years. And it was a lot of fun to do. And I got some really interesting snare textures where the snare is its own separate instrument. It's not part of the drum kit. It's just like <laughs> right. its own. And that was the style for a while. And you know, I did the exact opposite of so many things that you're talking about right now. But again, that was having the end vision in mind. And the end vision is we're going for this hyper real overworked kind of produced impressionistic snare drum sound idea. And to do that, I need to do the exact opposite of all the, the classic rock mixing things that Mike is talking about. Um, so I think that's a, that's a big point whenever you're mixing, like you said, just to have the end goal in mind because it can change the process. But I imagine since you've had so much success with this really powerful, organic sounding rock stuff that a lot of people are bringing you that again and again. So you get to kind of go through this process again and again on, on stuff within that style, I'd imagine. Um, with that said, are you it's, taking the same approach if it's a singer songwriter or, or, or does well, this approach work with other genres for you too? Yes and no. I mean, like, I'm actually mixing a song, some songs for a guy right now that are much more singer songwritery and almost like 70s sounding. And so I'm, I, I still use a lot of the same techniques I just apply them differently, you mm -hmm, know, like mm -hmm. where maybe I, I mean, like on the, the first thing, there's almost no reverb on anything. And I love that, you know, I mean, I love making big, powerful drums, but sometimes I feel like it'd be nice to not do that. But I know that that's what the person who hired me to mix it is expecting me to send them. So I'm just right. like. So sometimes maybe I'll bring it up before and say, hey, you know, I could really hear these drums nice and dry and thuddy. You know, what do you think? And they'll say, well, I don't know. Is if, if if I get any pushback and I'm like, oh, okay, I'll I'll stick to the trick. You know what I mean? But mm -hmm. but I do like to I do like to just um have it be 
you know, free. I don't want to just do one thing, you know? So it is nice with this guy's thing um, that I'm just kind of making it thud. I mean, I swear to God, I had like a, you know, an early late seventies Toto drum sound going on. It was like, man, it's listening back going, all right, I'm, I'm going with it, you know? And he, he, yeah. he, he seems to dig it. So, um, but you can take this same process then and adapt it to a bunch of different sounds. Like you were saying at the beginning, sometimes you want a roomier, more ambient sound. Sometimes you want a tighter, cleaner, leaner sound. But you can use this same process of we're going to double check the recording engineer's work, double check their phase alignment, their time alignment. We're going to go in and get the close mic sounding happening and impressive and interesting and appropriate to the track at hand. Then we're going to start uh, you know, doing some parallel compression on that to add whatever aggression we need to add. Then we're going to start bringing in our overheads and bringing in our rooms to kind of fill out the thing. So you can take that same approach each time, but by doing different things, go for that clean and tight sound or go for that big and bashy sound. Well, because if you think about it, the relationships are the relationships. If they work, then at that point, then it's just balance. If I can make sure everything works 100% together, then I can change those balances, but those time and phase relationships don't ever change. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, I think of it like if I want to use a ton of it, I can do that because I know it fits. If I don't want to use a ton of it, that's okay too because it, it fits, you know? Right. So yeah, it, you know, it really comes down to like maybe I don't use as much of the parallel compression if I want it drier or I don't use the room mics at all and I filter the, the, the overhead so it's tighter and a little more in your face. So, or I make the snare drum thuddier or something like that. You know, I have a thing, it's, it's in the course, but I take my snare and split it into like four separate channels because I want to have like my dry, straight snare and then I've got a bright snappy thing and then I've got a big thud where I find the resonance peak of the snare and then I've got the snare bottom and I can choose the way I use those four to create the sound I'm hoping to hear. Ultimately, I'm just trying to make that drum sound like itself just better. Mm -hmm. But if I want to make, take it somewhere else, it's a little easier to do that when you've broken it into kind of four separate components. Well, that sounds like a lot of work compared to opening up my snare sample library and throwing oh, on some goodness. ill sample, samples. So, Mike, is it a matter of principle that you're not putting samples in as a part of your process? Do you ever do that? Do you ever say, I, man, I'm never going to get to where they want to be without subbing in a sample? Uh, is this part of your workflow at all ever? Um, if someone sends me a sample, then I, I, I expect they're wanting to hear it, so I'll use it. But I do tend to put it under just to give it support more than anything. I, you know, the principle to me just comes down to that I, 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 I can hear them like crazy when I, whenever I hear a sample, like it's so obvious to me that it's a sample that, I mean, I've had guys that send me stuff and they're like, yeah, I barely use any of the samples. It's like, that's all I can hear is samples. What are you talking about? It sounds like the exact same snare hit every time. It's like, really, you can hear that? I was like, how could you not hear that? It's like plain as your nose on your face, you know? So, um, but if someone sends it to me, I understand that that's what they want. Devil's um, advocate again here for a second, Mike. Have you ever heard a major release from a major artist that uh, a lot of people really like. It sold a ton of copies. People love this band and you can hear the samples. Oh yeah. Yeah, every okay. day. So, that, so this is my devil's <laughs> advocate thing here. It's not necessarily bad then, you know, if, if oh, it's no. getting people the end result they want, but it to you, it's aesthetically less pleasing. So you try not to do it. Is that the idea? Yeah, but you know, maybe it's because I, you know, I hold the drums I was a drummer, you know, I hold right. it in high regard and I think of kind of the microdynamics of the way drums are played. And I think of all the greatest drum performances I've ever, I've ever heard on record and whatever. And they all possessed that all those microdynamics were, were, were preserved. And once you throw samples into the thing, I don't care how good a sample library you have. I don't care how precise you are. It's never going to be the same. You're never going to get the same amount of variation of, of tone and impact and level that to me the drummer played it the band li it's like people like the band enough that they recorded something and they're going to buy it yeah. and the drummer's part of that band why shouldn't i present that guy you know right. i mean well i'm gonna do the devil's advocate thing again here mike because he's terrible. And every once in a while that does happen. Now you've had the great fortune of working with some amazing artists where like the drummers are incredible. I mean, you listen to, uh, I mean, at the drive-in, even if you don't like that uh, music, yeah, no, I mean, the Tony's musicianship is, is insane. Um, 
but there are like new bands, their first EP, first album, they're doing their first demos and the drummer is never going to sound what they're like what their favorite records sound like, but maybe the rest of the band is doing pretty well. And they say, wow, you know, I mean, the snare hits are kind of all over the place microdynamically and what can we do to even him out and, right. and support that? But I guess you'd rather do that through parallel bus compression to give him that right. support rather than give him too much of the drum machine treatment of, of relying right. heavily on the and, and I mean, I have, uh, there's probably been, I'd say a half a dozen times that I have actually grabbed the best snare hit of the of the tr project mm -hmm. and use and use that under the other thing usually i do it more as a oh there's so much hi-hat in the snare mic that right. i can't get it like i want so at mm -hmm. least i'm using his snare and he's so horrible that i am going to make him a little better that you know but that's always a last resort because i have you know i really think with with hard enough work and getting everything to work together and eq and phase and i mean transient designers all these little tools that we have available to us you can usually eke something out of it and it will still resemble something like what they played you know right that's yeah. you know again it's me i i know lots of bands that would be perfectly happy if i would throw samples in there but if i was ever going to go that route then i would want to go to a studio and record my own samples at least oh interesting yeah at least you know right so uh, now that we're on a controversial and contentious subject, I wonder if we can go a little more controversial and contentious still. Do you edit at any point, um, you know, once you've got these sounds established, is there a point where you are editing drums or editing uh, a band? Is that part of your process? Or not? Um, you know, when I'm mixing, I try not to, you know, I, I try and keep that separate because I don't want people to think they can send me drums that are a mess and I'm going to send them back something that's, you know, all taken care of. But um I also know that it's not that hard to edit if you have to. Usually if I listen to the mix and I get distracted by something repeatedly, then I'm going to fix it. Mm -hmm. If if they send it to me, then they must think it's done. So I, I, I tend to leave that like, okay, that's what you sent me. But again, if I hear a fill or maybe people are hitting something and I'll hit, I'll hit them together, then I'll just grab a few things and get everybody. But I never do stuff to the grid. I always do it by ear. I, I've, I've never, I've never used like beat detective or any of that stuff. I, I actually, I take that back. I used it once for a shaker. I, I got a shaker to line up with a drum, drum track. And it was pretty amazing how I well can it tell you're old school. Cause you say rewind and you've never used beat right. detective, but I like that's, it, Mike. I like that's it. Right. Well, I just, uh, you know, I'm not saying the technology is not incredible because it really is. But when I edit, like when I track, when I edit drums, I just hit play and I listen. And if something make, make, makes me do this or, or I, you know, then I stop and I listen again. If it bugs me, I'll fix it. And then I'll move on. You know, I figure I've got a good enough ear. If it bugs me, it's a problem. If it doesn't bug me, it shouldn't bother anybody. Right. I hope. You know? So if people are going to edit, probably the best time to do editing is before mixing. I mean, mixing and editing are not the same thing. And if you were the kind of mixer who does editing, and I've been that kind of guy in the past, I've always found that the best time to edit is before I'm going into making a tonal decisions. And I yeah. see there's another job. I'm doing the drum editing job. Once we're done with the drum editing job, now we can do the mixer's job. Uh, otherwise, I mean, it seems to take 10 times as long instead of oh, twice yeah. as long. So, well, yeah, um, it's harder to keep track when you got a ton of automation showing and you know, you're like, wait, did I grab everything? I know I got it grouped, but how come that thing, it didn't come with it? You know, right. I, oh. Yeah, forget so, it. So uh, now that we've ended up putting on our reverbs, are there any last little things? you apply any global bus compression on, any global I do. EQ? Are there any additional I, I do. Things, so? so all my drums and my parallel bus drums, they go to their own. There's a parallel sub master and then my, what I call my comp drums master. Mm -hmm. So that goes through another, usually a console emulation, um, very, very mild compression and sometimes a little bit of EQ. But then the cymbals, the hi-hat, the room mics go directly to the all drum bus. And then I put a really good EQ on that. So they all get combined out of one, it comes out of one stereo fader. And I kind of have some global tone controls for everything. And I try and, I, you know, it's kind of like to me, I, I, I approach it like mastering that, you know, when I master something, you can only affect everything with your EQ. Right. I mean, you know, selectively you can find little things, but you're really affecting everything with every move you make. Yeah. So I try and do the same thing with the drums that I would rather boost the top end on my drum master bus than go and boost top end on 16 channels of drums. I think it sounds much more linear, not to mention it points to problems that may show up. Like if, you know, the hi-hat is a little dull, 
and then I brighten everything else up to make the hi-hat the right brightness, well, now the snare is too bright. Well, so I can go back and make the snare a little less bright because it's like I kind of choose whatever the, the EQ will make everything better. And then you make your selective changes to kind of compensate for what might have gone wrong from a big boost in the low or a little boost in the bow and little boost in the top end, you know, that kind of stuff. But I, I, I try and, you know, do the heavy lifting with the really good stuff on the master buses and then just selectively do the things that need it on the individual channels. And are you bringing that in at the end of the process rather than the yeah. beginning of the process? Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I know some people when they mix with compression, same like on their stereo bus, they like to have it in all the time. And I, yeah. I prefer to get my mix like I want it. And then let's see how much can I compress to give me a little bit more RMS without right. changing it too much, you know? Yeah. Just to reiterate that there are different ways of doing things. I have to say, I've, I've done both approaches probably near the end of my mixing career before I really went to mastering. I was getting more and more to doing more on the bus and less on the channels in part because I felt like it made me work uh, faster, more organically and less micromanagey and that sometimes I would get where I wanted sooner. But yes, you do have absolutely much less control and usually that um, that works better if you're not trying to uh, micromanage some of the sounds and you're treating the uh, mics you have as more of a single cohesive instrument rather than a collection of instruments, each of which can you know be defined even more. So this right. is just one other thing I just want to reiterate for people is that this is not this is a process that has worked for you again and again and again for more than a decade and it has not you've not been hurting and saying i can't get my drums to sound great you feel like hey i, I when i follow this process i know that i'm going to get a great sound every time and i just want to throw out there to whoever disagrees with any of these key points i still think you can take a lot out of this conversation because if you are the kind of person who wants to throw up bus compression first or bus eq first um, still, I mean, there's huge uh, takeaways talking about how to think about reverb, how to think about bringing in your room mics. Uh, just the idea, if some people didn't even realize they were allowed to do this, just send your kick and snare through a parallel uh, compressor. You don't have to send right. the entire thing. So uh, well, that's one of the things I love. Even if you're not going to take someone else's approach completely, there's so many insights to glean. And I just do want to throw that out there is that your approach is fantastic. And I know it works for you every single time. And I know that I've also talked to other people whose results I love, whose approach is completely different. So I just right. do want to throw that out there here at the end, that this is not the only way to approach drums. It's a way that has really worked for Mike. And if it seems intuitive and attractive to you, you can go into a lot of detail on this stuff with Mike through both of his articles on Sonic Scoop, which are fantastic. He's written, I believe, a four-part series about mixing drums on Sonic Scoop completely free. And for people who want to go into even more depth and hear him make some of these changes in real time to see if this approach could work well for them, the course uh, Mixing Drums from Method of the Mix, if you go to mixingdrums.com, is just a, a fantastic resource. And I really appreciate you putting out that article, those articles and putting out that course for people. Uh, oh, yeah. I don't want to take up too much of your time. I think we're running close to an hour here. And um, I mean, it's just, it's been fantastic to hear you go into such detail on this stuff. Is there anything else major about the actual drum process that we've left off that we should uh, kind of talk about to put a final cap on the drum aspect? I mean, honestly, I think it, it, it you know, if there's anything that's kind of overreaching for all of it or overarching for all of it to me is just it it should all be about trying to make the song sound the right way you know yeah. i i i i admit i mix the drums loud that that's one of my things and mm -hmm. you know i will go to my grave with it needs more snare you know but it, it's <laughs> it's it, it to me it, it it's always in service of trying to make that track come across the way you hear it and you know it's not like i've i've tried to make my process complicated that's just what happened. And it mm -hmm. was kind of a, you, you, you go through these periods where like, you know, I've gotten somewhere with it, but I haven't quite gotten this like I want. And so then you discover some new technique and or maybe you hear someone else talk about something, you kind of take that and then make it your own. And that's all that's happened. And now I feel like if I don't do all those things, I'm really not giving the drum sound the, the approach or the, the attention it needs. So I yeah. think it's more just about, you know, drummers are generally happy with what I send them, you know? Yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, usually the band wants less snare drum, but they're wrong. But, you know, that's, <laughs> that's something else. Um, well, one of the things I do love about your pr approach is a way to get a lot of control and to really enhance things without going that route of 
sample replacing everything and making things too artificial. So you're able to get a lot of control over things while still keeping something unique and uh, organic and original about the recording. So I love how you're able to kind of capture both those things, control while also letting it be what it is. Well, I'm hoping if someone listens to something I mixed, and this is not just the drums, it's everything, I want it to be like they believe that that's really a band. Mm-hmm. That that does, you know, because there's a lot of productions nowadays that even in like the rock, especially heavier rock stuff that, you know, that band doesn't sound like that. You know that they can't play like that. And there's nothing really resembling reality. Sometimes that's the genre. And I get yeah, that. Absolutely. But that's if I work on it, I want it to be like you can picture those dudes right there. Uh, there they are. Yeah. Everyone's playing. And it's I I know that's a drummer because that's exactly what that sounds like. I know that's a guitarist because it doesn't it, it it's refined, it's presented, but it doesn't sound worked. It doesn't sound overworked. I don't right. like things to sound overworked. Yeah, I guess we really should title this podcast something along the lines of you know mixing drums for I would say rock metal. Uh, I would say, I don't know if pop is the right word because pop can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But have you ever worked in the idioms of, say, hip hop or EDM? And does an approach like this work there? Or is it just a completely different animal uh, in those genres? I haven't done much EDM. I did a tiny bit of hip hop. I, I, you know, I've tried some of these techniques and sometimes people really like it and sometimes they don't. It's definitely not as absolute because sometimes... I think it adds too many other time elements to like when you parallel compress a loop, for example, sometimes it's great. Other times it mushes it out and what they liked about it was how it was. So, Mm -hmm. you know, because the bed tracks for these kinds of things are generally pretty specific. Yeah. I, I, I find hip hop to maybe be a little harder to apply that to. Now, Mm -hmm. if you're there tracking it with them and creating Mm -hmm. the loops, then you can do all that stuff. But, you know, if someone's bringing you something to mix, it's pretty much already done. Yeah, I I find it a little more difficult to to manipulate the same way you can. Right. Last thing you want to do is take a a groove that people have established where there aren't a million different mics interacting with each other. And then all of a sudden you're nudging the snare by 30, 50 samples and then the groove changes. Right. And it's like, hey, the rhythms of of everything we were doing were attached to exactly where that snare was landing. And maybe it's still within that um, that Haas uh, threshold yep, where yep, we're not really Haas hearing window, yep. it shift, but something's changed. Whereas when you have all of these different mics swimming together, those little changes you make aren't really changing the overall drum feel because the overall drum feel is informed by all of those mics. So you can right. move a snare, but the snare is in so many other things that you're not totally uh, changing Uh, where it's landing. And if you are, hopefully you're changing it for the better. Uh, One other thing I would say, not to be too long-winded about this, is when you're dealing with bands that are tracking all together in headphones, they are not necessarily all hearing the snare land in exactly the same place um, in the final mix as they were when they were recording. Because if you're in the band and you have headphones, you have the snare arriving at a certain time, but you also have the acoustic snare arriving right. at a certain time. And depending on what the balance was between close mic and overhead mics in your headphones, it can land at a different time. So in some ways, exactly where each thing is hitting can be a little bit more nebulous when there's so many places that same hit is coming from. So I think you have more flexibility to potentially nudge things a bit and not change feel and groove um yeah i never really thought about i'm kind of thinking about this as i'm talking it through so maybe i'll totally change my mind on that but as of today it sounds about right and i hope nobody totally flames me out in the comments but if you want to flame me out in the comments please go ahead it will help the youtube algorithm uh show our video to more people so (laughs) criticize me as much as possible if you want to uh also uh, throw uh, heaps of praise on me and Mike. That would be appreciated as well. It helps keep us going. It's like drinking the blood of the innocent, and then we can uh, make even more podcasts for you in the future. Mike Major, Major. the man who wrote the book on drum recording <laughs> called Recording Drums, The Complete Guide, and a fantastic course on a drum mixing, mixing drums. Also, if you want someone to shepherd you through the process of treating your room Mike was super helpful when I needed to really build out my home studio here and get the right amount of bass trapping and diffusion for the space. I walked him through the measurements uh, of the room and he's done this with so many people so many times now that he really knew exactly what I wanted real fast. So if you can get in touch uh, with him through GIK Acoustics too if you want someone to just help you uh, select at no additional charge, you know, select the acoustic treatment sol- solutions that are going to work great for your room. He's great with that. He's great with mixing stuff. My goodness, 
What is Mike Major not great at? Mike, where are the best places for the people to get in contact with you? Um, they can contact me through my website, mikemajormix.com. There's a contact form in there. That That's a good way to reach me. Um, or uh, my email at GIK, if you got acoustics questions, is just mike.m at gikacoustics.com. Or you can go to the contact page on the GIK website and uh, you'll see my ugly mug and my contact information, along with James and John, my two co-worker designer guys who are, you know, also equally uh, equally uh, helpful and uh, good at this. Right, wonderful. Actually, probably better now that I oh, think about hush. it. Now, no, they really, you... I, I mean, these guys are so good. I, yeah. I, I love working with these guys. <laughs> all right. Now, uh, another quick thing. Are you on the social media at all? Is that a good place for people? I, to I am, get yeah. If I, I, I'm on... Uh, uh, geez, I think it's Mike Major Mix on Twitter, and uh, it's probably just Mike Major on Facebook. I should know this, and I don't. I probably, I probably looked at it when I set up my account, and that's the last time I checked on it. So, All right. but yes, right. I'm out there. And your course about uh, mixing drums, people can find at mixingdrums.com. What's one thing that you think makes it different than uh, the other courses out there that go over some of the the same ideas or topic? Um, mostly that I tried to go through what I was thinking while I was doing it. Mm -hmm. I wasn't just saying, oh, I'm going to EQ the kick drum now. I choose this one because I like it. It's like, no, I'm going, well, kick drum sounds kind of like it's wrong like this. So I want to get an EQ that does this. Mm -hmm. And then and then I do it. And I show you what happens when I do it. You know, so right. I, it's, yeah. it's, I tried to make it more like when I got to assist. I didn't do a lot of assisting early in my career, but there were a few times I did. And when you get to watch someone do it, it, makes you think differently about it when you sit down it because I, I really don't think it's a it's hard to learn the techniques i think it's hard to think about what you're supposed to think about before you do it that that that's usually what holds people back is that they don't even know what questions to ask mm -hmm. so you know that's what i'm hoping to do is i just talk too much about it while i'm doing it so you'll think it's like well this is what i'm thinking right now so next time you sit down maybe you'll kind of look inside the mix a little bit more Right. And one last quick question for you. I know we're in wrap up mode, but I just want to throw out there. We're really talking about just mixing the drums because in Mike's approach is the first thing he does. It's really the foundation, the spine to his mix. And he feels like if he gets that right, the rest of it can really come together. My question for you before we part is once you've moved on, you feel like you've got the drums in a great place. And now you're starting to bring in other elements. Uh, I imagine you may revisit the drums at some point as other elements are coming in. And when you're doing that, are you doing it more from individual channels, more from the uh, master bus? And if things change, what are the most likely things to change once you start introducing other elements? Yeah, I mean, to me, the door is always open. You know, not, the mix isn't done till the mix is done. So uh, more than likely, kick and snare are the thing that probably get touched the most. Um, I have a, you know, a kick and snare bus, and I might do global things there. You know, honestly, it's kind of all of the above, you know, I mean, the overhead balance, overheads are super important. Um, I like to get that right. But sometimes you find that once you've got a pile of guitars in the mix, sometimes maybe the overheads are too much or too little. It depends on how you're driving the stereo bus and how that's compressing that sometimes things will jump up and down. So I'm constantly... I'm constantly going back to that stuff. I try my best to get it. It's kind of like I was saying, the relationships, if I get the relationships right with all of the drum mics, then I can make any change I want and it's still going to fit. Uh, right. And that that's ultimately the goal that, yeah, you know, I, I can mess with anything and it doesn't matter what I do because it's not going to, you know, rear its ugly head right before you print the mix. Wonderful. Thanks so much for taking the time, Mike. Uh, just a couple last Pleasure. words here. You can find Mike at the GIK Acoustics website if you want to uh, have some help in selecting panels for your room. You can find him at MikeMajorMix.com if you want some help mixing. You can find him at MixingDrums.com or Sonic Scoop if you want either premium or free uh, tutorials on drum mixing, uh, DIY acoustics, and a whole lot more. A big shout out. Thanks again to our sponsors one more time. Sonarworks sponsoring this podcast all of this uh, month. Thank you, Sonar Sonarworks, for helping uh, make rooms and headphones uh, sound better. Thank you so much to Sound Toys for making very, very cool plugins, uh, some of my favorites. And uh, thank you to Gear Club, another great podcast. If you haven't checked it out already, please do. It's got like 100 or so uh, five-star uh, ratings on iTunes, so you're not going to be the only person enjoying it. Gear-club.net or just type in Gear Club uh, anywhere where you might get your podcasts. Thanks for hanging out with me. This has been Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop. Please remember to subscribe here 
on iTunes, on YouTube, on uh, Android podcast, wherever you might be getting this. Feel free to comment anywhere on social media or on YouTube. We love getting comments and questions that way. You can email me directly at podcast at sonicscoop.com. And if you haven't already, I encourage you to go to sonicscoop.com upper right hand section there you can click newsletter sign up and get email the best of sonic scoop delivered to your inbox each and every week each and every thursday uh, only good stuff only once a week emails of just great articles tips tutorials reviews on music and sound thanks so much mike for joining us it's been a blast having you on and thank you and thank you guys for hanging out with us see you next time <laughs>